Chapter 8 of The Airplane Boys Among the Clouds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Airplane Boys Among the Clouds by John Luther Langworthy. Chapter 8. Mysterious Mr. Marsh at it again. What's the hurry, remarked Frank, who seemed much more composed than his chum. Why, think of the impudence of that man, burst out Andy taking advantage of our being away to prowl around our shop. Now you're guessing, you know. He may be only intending to call on us. Anyhow, it's no use to think of trying to get there in time. We just couldn't do it. And besides, Larry and Elephant are there. But we don't think they're fools, do we, Frank remarked, as he again used the glasses. There, didn't he go inside the shop, demanded Andy, straining his eyes to see what went on far below. That's so, but Larry promptly walked him out again. They're talking right now in front of the door, and the other two fellows fill the doorway, Frank reported. I just bet he'll pull the wool over their eyes again and again. I know he's a soft talker, and can blarney to beat the band. Oh, if we could only shout loud enough to make them hear. Or if we had our wigwag flags along with us, and Andy actually groaned with the suspense. Come, let up, old fellow, observed Frank. What's the use worrying like that? You know we fix things so even if he got in again he'd see precious little to give him any satisfaction. There, Larry is walking away from the door with him. Give him credit for being sharp enough to see through a grindstone that has a hole in it, will you? Bully for Larry. He's all to the good, exclaimed the other. But tell me what's doing now, Frank. The gentleman is holding out his hand, and Larry takes it. So I reckon they didn't have any hard words, Frank answered quickly. And is he going away, demanded Andy. Seems like it. There he stops and looks around, as if he might be interested in our field and arrangements for tryouts. I hope he don't turn back again and force his way in. You know, he could easy enough do that, Frank, because there are only three boys and two of them hardly worth counting, Andy observed anxiously. Nothing doing, commented Frank. He started again for the road where the car stands. Here, take another look at that car before it goes off. All right, Frank and I'm all balled up about why you want me to do that, replied Andy, suiting the action to the word. You see which way the car heads, don't you? asked his cousin. Sure, toward town. That's as plain as the nose on my face, Andy answered. And from that you judge they'd been out for a spin, wouldn't you? Ask me something harder, won't you, Frank? said Andy scornfully. But you forget that they expected to hand their car over to the man at the garage to be entirely overhauled. That was to be their excuse for remaining over in Bloomsbury a couple of days, Frank exploded. Wow, that's so, exclaimed the startled Andy, and seems now they didn't bother doing it. Something else gripped them to Bloomsbury. They concluded that they had right good need of their old car while they hung around here. Frank, it knocks me silly, but I honestly own up I just can't get the hang of this thing. Well, I'm almost in as bad a state as you are over, replied the other, as he pressed his lips firmly together in thought. But, Andy, that wasn't all I wanted you to notice when I asked you to look at the way the car stood. It wasn't, eh? Well, please keep right along, now that you've got started, Frank. I'm shivering all over with excitement right now. Something seems to tell me we're in for a new set of adventures that will make all the others look tame. If they came along that road, Andy, it would have been the easiest thing in the world for Mr. Marsh and his friend to have been up in the neighborhood of the old deserted shack half an hour ago. Andy stared into his cousin's face, while an ashen hue spread over his own usually cheery countenance. Oh my, then you believe, he began when Frank interrupted him by saying, I don't believe anything, but the circumstance seemed a little suspicious to me, that's all. It's possible, and that's the extent of what flashed into my mind. But we have no proof, and I'd hate to think that Mr. Marsh could be guilty of such a nasty thing as trying to injure us. Shall we make a start now? asked Andy, who seemed more or less in a daze. I suppose we might as well. Look at the eagles dipping lower and lower. They've got some young ones in the nest, and if we went closer there'd be a circus going on pretty quick. But we're not looking for trouble today, Frank remarked. No need to, reply the other instantly, because it's hunting us. They were very careful to make sure that no loose stones barred the way, for as the plateau was very short they must sail off into the air 
almost immediately on starting the engine, and even a small turn at such a critical moment was apt to cause the biplane to swerve and bring about a catastrophe. But the start was successfully accomplished. Frank always paid so much attention to little things that he was not very apt to be caught napping. Straight home, asked Andy, once they were afloat, and heading down from the dizzy height. Yes, replied his cousin. I'm curious to hear what our friend Mr. Marsh could have had to say to Larry, and how the boy carried out his job of keeping strangers from nosing around inside the shop. Just as well that we left when we did, remarked Andy, for over in the southwest I noticed some clouds that may bring a lot of wind along, and whether that no self-respecting aeroplane has any business to be out in. Why, yes, I've seen the peak of old Thundertop buried in low-hanging clouds many a time, Frank declared, and it wouldn't be the nicest thing in the world for us to be caught up there with a wild storm raging. Ugh, deliver me from that experience, grunted Andy, turning his head to look back toward the peak they had just left, and which was already far astern. So rapidly did the little but powerful Kincaid engine whirl the biplane onward when led out to its limit. Frank kept his eyes ahead, but he knew when his companion gazed toward the dense woods away off to the right where they had been fired at by the unknown marksman. Still harping on that bang, eh? he observed. Yes, and I won't have any peace till we find out who fired that shot, answered the other doggedly. Just think how nasty it is to never know when you're going to be potted like an old crow. It takes most of the fun out of flying, that's what. Well, wait a little, and perhaps we may learn something, Frank went on, and before his companion could make any remark, he suddenly switched the conversation by saying, The boys are waving their hats to us, and I thought I got a faint yell. But the breeze is dead wrong for hearing. I'm tickled to death with the handsome way the machine carries herself, and that's a satisfaction worthwhile, eh? So Andy stopped twisting around to look back and confined his attention to the scene in front. As they drew closer to the practice field, the shouts of the trio of lads near the shop came plainly to their ears. Then Frank began circling and cutting figure eights, wishing to discover just what the biplane could do in that line. Perhaps he also was not averse to giving the admiring audience below something more to gape at. But all the same, Frank took no great chances. He was too cautious and level-headed a boy to do that, unless the emergency called for it and then his nerve was equal to any demand. When the biplane finally dropped down to the ground close by the hangar where it was to be housed, the three comrades were only too glad of a chance to clutch hold and assist to the best of their ability. She's just a Jim dandy for going and turning, Frank, exclaimed Larry. Yes, exclaimed Elephant. I used to think that little bug was the limit, but now I say I was a way off. This biplane has got her number all right, why, there ain't anything you couldn't trust her to do, fellows. W -w -w with f Frank at the helm, you mean, spluttered Nat. Oh, that goes without saying, Nat, declared Elephant. We was wondering whether you had another scrap with the two pirates up there, remarked Larry, pointing toward old Thundertop. No, the eagles have become used to seeing an aeroplane by now. They came close to watch us because they've got eaglets in the nest but never once swooped down to strike at us with talons, wings, or beaks, Frank replied. We're going to tame him so as to shake hands with us, grinned Andy. I was watching you through the old telescope Andy has here, observed Larry, and which he says one of his ancestors used when he was captain of a sailing vessel more than eighty years ago. She worked fine, too, though a bit clumsy. And Frank, what under the sun did you make that sudden upward slant for when you was away off over the Powell Woods? Phew! I thought you'd sure go clean over backwards. The bird boys exchanged glances, which of course aroused the curiosity of the observing Larry more than ever. Here, none of that now, fellows, he remarked. There's something in the wind and you've just got to tell us all about it. Did the lever break or get away from your grip, Frank? There was a reason for that jump, and I know it. Sure there was, said Andy. If you heard a gun go bang a few hundred feet below, and then got the zip-zip of the bullet as it whipped past not five feet from your ears, perhaps you'd move the ascending lever some too and take chances on getting out of that dangerous spot in a big hurry, eh? Larry and the other two could not reply at once. The explanation given by Andy fairly took their breath away, so that they could only stare and gasp. End of chapter 8